Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, I'm happy to hear a lot of noise. That's a good sign. So you're all connected. That's a very good thing. Congresses are here to connect and to share knowledge and to connect with people. That's, that's wonderful to see. Um, I have to tell you two things I forgot before the break. Uh, we have, uh, you can, can uh, send a tweet to a hashtag F SS 2018, FSS 2018. So if you like to send a tweet, we would uh, appreciate that. And then uh, I got a tip and uh, that was very nice. Uh, we have a microphone and uh, after uh, the presentation of the next speaker, I'm gonna throw the microphone so people can expect uh, the microphone somewhere and you can give it to your neighbor if you don't want to ask the question yourself. Uh, <laughs> and uh, please say your name before you ask the question so we're, we're, we know who you are, where you're coming from and what, what's your back background. Uh, and now, after the break, for, before the lunch, we have two wonderful speakers. They know each other very well. They are Bart and Luke. Bart is the first speaker, and he's coming from the University of Ghent in Belgium. Bart Merci, he is the head of the research unit Combustion, Fire and Fire Safety at the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture. And um, he is connected to a lot of universities in Europe, uh, and he's going to tell us about, it's very technical, uh, research of numerical simulations of fire spread in general. So I hope it, I pronounced it in the right way, and otherwise you can correct me, Luke, uh, Bart, sorry, I already are mixing you up, but you said it was not a problem, and you fight it out together later on. Okay, well, uh, Bart, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yolanda, for this uh, introduction. Um, as you said, oh, I didn't do that. My name is, uh, is Bart Merci from uh, Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, this is the uh, Dutch speaking part in Belgium. So uh, even though Yolanda was way too modest on the level of her English, uh, you're sure not Belgian? You're, you're, yeah, okay. uh, then uh, I, it might be that some of you feel uncomfortable asking a question in English. Uh, you can also ask questions in Dutch. Uh, I will uh, translate that question and into English. If it's too difficult a question, I'll translate it into something else in English. But I'll uh, I'll try to give a, I'll try to give an answer. So don't feel uncomfortable if you uh, if you want to ask uh, a question. And um, as mentioned by the the chair, it's going to be a, a rather technical uh, presentation. But nevertheless, I'll I'll do my best to. Uh, uh, to try and explain uh, some of the physics that are involved in um, in vertical flame spread. Uh, we, we've seen unfortunate recent incidents over the past few years uh, on uh, facade fires. Uh, and I'll try to go a bit back into the fundamentals, into the physics, and, and see what kind of aspects are important and which ones uh, might be of primary importance and which ones might be uh, a little bit less uh, important. If it is too technical, uh, you can shout, and then I'll, uh, I'll, try, to, uh, I'll try to adjust. But uh, I'll, I'll try to talk you through some of these uh, uh, processes that take place. Uh, so primarily, uh, we will need to take into account heat transfer, so heat stemming from flames and going and attacking materials, and then these materials will react uh, to that, and there will be some mass transfer in the sense that combustible material will, um, will be released, and then as such, you can have a uh, developing fire. Uh, I'll very briefly touch upon uh, MACFP, which is a, a fairly recent initiative, a research initiative uh, for academic uh, institutes, primarily uh, trying to uh, understand some of the fundamentals of, uh, of fire science. And one of the target test cases is indeed vertical flame spread over flat uh, surfaces. Uh, but I'll try to uh, focus also a bit on the importance of geometry. Yeah, so I will not dig uh, in, into material properties and, and material behavior per se, uh, but I'll try to explain that also the geometry is, is quite important when you want to investigate uh, these types of, uh, of fire spread. And uh, hopefully I can make some uh, concluding comments that make sense uh, to you. Um, so let's start with the, the most difficult part. If you want to take a nap, now is the time to do so. It's going to last for about 10, 15 minutes, so that's just enough to have a power nap. Uh, but if you want to bear with me now, I'll try to explain some of the fundamentals of uh, what's happening if you have some, uh, some fire spread. 
And uh, may, mo uh, or, um, f often, uh, people think of this primarily as kind of a material issue, but obviously if you have a, a fire, many of the uh, um, phenomena are taking place in the gas phase. And there, uh, to make things a bit more complex, flows are typically turbulent. Um, I'm saying here uh, mostly uh, turbulent because I will come back to this when we talk about curtain walls, and that's maybe in, in such situations turbulence cannot develop as much uh, as what we see uh, out in the open. But as soon as you have a fire of some reasonable size, uh, the flows become turbulent, and that complicates things uh, in terms of uh, heat transfer and mass transfer. I'll come back to that uh, in a second. Now, the flames that we see uh, are the result of combustion processes, and also this combustion process, again, takes place in the gas phase, primarily. Uh, you can have some reactions inside the solid phase, which would then be called smoldering combustion inside, this will also happen when you have vertical fire spread, but these processes are typically so slow that they would not be dominant uh, when uh, it comes to the uh, visible uh, fire spread over uh, vertical uh, surfaces. Nevertheless, what happens uh, inside the material can be important, uh, and also in relation to heat transfer, because inside the material you will have what is called conduction, yeah, so your conductive uh, heat transfer inside the solid, there's no motion inside the solid, so that's the dominant one there, uh, but in the gas phase you have convection and radiation, and each one of those are, are uh, again quite quite complex to, um, to fully understand. And to uh, make things even more complex, uh, we have important phenomena taking place inside the material, and this is then called pyrolysis, and so that's chemical processes taking place, degrading the material, and, uh, and effectively releasing combustible gases into the gas phase. You can talk for hours on each and every single one uh, of these uh, bullets, uh, so that illustrates that each and uh, every single one of them is complex by itself, but uh, even worse, they also have a very strong interaction uh, amongst each other. And so that means that if you fail to understand or if you fail to correctly uh, represent one of these processes, this might also have an impact on other phenomena taking place, even if you were in the position of having those completely under control which we're not fully at the moment. And so that's the, uh, the context of, um, of what we're going to talk about. So uh, I want to start off with two figures. Uh, again, these are, I think, the most complex ones to, uh, to understand, so I'll give you the difficult uh, things at the beginning. Uh, what you see here is a sketch from uh, a book that uh, I wrote together with uh, my postdoctoral researcher, Tarek Beji. Uh, it's a very nice Christmas present, by the way, if you, uh, you want to have this uh, underneath your Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> Just saying, um, but but this is one of the sketches that you um, you, you will find in this book. Uh, so here at the right hand side, you would have the solid material, uh, and the uh, solid material, as long as the material does not participate in the combustion process, this would be called virgin material. So this is material that has not been affected yet uh, by what's uh, what's going on. The uh, orange yellow line that you see is a very strong simplification of a flame. Yeah, so in practice, it will uh, look much more complex than this, but just to set the mind, uh, you can think of this orange line as the position where most of the heat is generated. Yeah, so there the combustion takes place, there is the flame, so the heat source uh, is, is over there. Uh, how does it happen? Well, you have the red arrows, that's uh, combustible material being released from the solid material that is already participating in the, in the process, and mixes with uh, air, yeah, with air from the surroundings. So you've seen from the first talk uh, that you need three ingredients for a fire. The same three ingredients uh, are here. And so you have oxygen uh, from the air being entrained into the flame, so mixing, and entrainment is a difficult term for mixing, with the, the fuel, uh, which is coming from the right-hand side, and the heat source is over here, this, uh, this orange line. Now, this flame will release the heat, and this heat is going into the environment. Most of the heat is actually going up by what is called buoyancy, so this is upward flow, the force of Archimedes, and light gases rise, and these uh, gases, they take away with them most of the heat released from the flame. So that would be called convection. Yeah? So that's a motion of the flow taking the heat uh, away. Part of this heat is also going in all directions by radiation. Okay? So this heat by convection in this upward motion and by radiation is actually 
partly going into the surroundings and going up, so not used for the, com for the pyrolysis uh, process in the solid material, but part of it is also being exchanged here with this portion of the solid material, which is taking uh, action uh, inside, so this is pyrolyzing. It's degrading, it's turning black probably, and it's releasing these combustible gases. And as such, you have a system that can keep itself uh, in place if you have a sufficient amount of heat release from the flame to keep the pyrolysis going, you have something that can keep going as long as you have fuel. If you have more heat available than what you need for the pyrolysis, then you will have a growing fire because you have uh, an amount of uh, energy extra that you can use for extra pyrolysis. If you have less heat uh, released per unit time than what you need for pyrolysis, the fire will die. And if it's more or less equal, then you have a constant uh, fire spread. Constant fire spread, you can have that in this sketch, and because this is a sketch for downward flame spread. Yeah? So you ignite somewhere at the top of the material, and then you allow the flames to uh, go down. Now, this is relatively slow uh, in uh, comparison to upward flame spread, where you see essentially more or less uh, the same sketch. Uh, but what you see now, if you pay attention, uh, and if not, I'll bring your attention to it now. Uh, what, what you, the, the key difference between this sketch and the previous one is that this flame basically sees mainly material that is already participating in the combustion process. So this flame is exchanging heat with material that, in a way, has already burnt. Uh, so there is no more or little combustible gas is left uh, to participate in the combustion process. So what happens uh, with that heat is that it needs to go down inside the solid material by conduction, which is a relatively slow process compared to convection and radiation. The convection is actually only going up, so that's only in contact with uh, non-virgin material. Radiation is also going a little bit down, yeah, so you, it will have some radiation from the flame here onto the virgin material, but there is something called the view factor, uh, which is expressing how well this material sees the flame. Well, if you're just here on this, on this spot in the virgin material, you see the flame, but you don't see a large area of the flame. You look at it from the line of sight and you see quite uh, uh, a short, uh, let's say, length scale for the, for the flame. Whereas if you look at this plot, again, Convection is mainly going up. Here is the material that is already participating in the combustion process. So you have the red arrows of fuel being released over here. But you can see that now a large portion of the flame is in direct contact or very close uh, to virgin material. So here you have these hot gases flowing up by convection, exchanging heat. In other words, heating up the virgin material. So that's one heat source. Plus, now this material sees the flame very well. You see here a very large portion of the flame in almost direct contact with the virgin material. So this heat transfer, this heating up of the virgin material is now going to be much faster than what you have in downward flame spread. And that's why vertical upward flame spread is so much faster than downward uh, flame spread. <laughs> Because this one is so much faster, this one is going to be the one I'm focusing on for the remainder of this, uh, of this talk. So, what, what have we learned so far? Yeah, so we have an importance of the buoyancy, this upward motion uh, by, um, by the uh, heating up. Uh, so this will have a more intense convection uh, heat transfer, but also the view factor, uh, so the, the way the virgin material sees the flame uh, is much higher. So that means a lot, of, a lot more uh, radiation. And also, in a way, the flame is kind of pushed uh, closer to the surface, if you have here entrainment from the uh, oxygen, from the air from the left-hand side, it kind of pushes a little bit the flame closer to the surface, uh, and it will also intensify uh, the, um, uh, the heat uh, transfer. Now, that was the physics. Uh, what I want to talk about is numerical simulations. In numerical simulations, uh, we, this is our core business at, at Ghent University, as, as some of you might know. Uh, and this, uh, the technique that we use for that is CFD. CFD is an acronym. It's called Computational Fluid Dynamics. So you try to use computations to express the dynamics of the fluids, the dynamics of the flows. Yeah, so that's the key uh, approach, uh, let's say, to, to uh, problems like this. 
Now, the difficult part in, in these kinds of simulations is that you have a so-called positive feedback loop. So, going back to this uh, slide once again, what you have here, these red arrows, that's the release of, let's say, combustible gases per unit time. This is kind of the feeding of fuel into the flame. That's not something that you know beforehand. That's something that you want to calculate automatically. Now, how can you calculate that? If you want to calculate that, you need to know how much heat is going into this material per unit time. In order to calculate that, you need to know where the flame is, how hot the flame is. In other words, you need the temperatures. Preferably, you also know how sooty the flame is, if you have a lot of soot production or not. And all these things will depend also on this release of fuel and on the mixing with air. So the problem is, suppose, think, think with me uh, if, if, you, if you want, suppose you are over-predicting here this fuel mass loss rate. Uh, so you are exaggerating how many combustible gases are released per unit time. What will happen is, if you have an overshoot here, you will predict a stronger flame. Stronger in the sense that it might be longer, it might have higher temperatures, it might have more radiation. So you are overestimating the heat transfer to the virgin material. Well, if you overestimate the heat transfer to the virgin material, you will again, even more, overestimate the release of combustible gases. And you get into this runaway cycle, and the previous talk was about physical thermal runaway. Here you can have a kind of a similar thing in the simulations. You have some runaway, so you keep deviating from reality. The same story can be told if you underestimate this. If you underestimate the fuel, then the flame will become weaker, you will have less heat transfer, and you will keep on underpredicting how fast this, this fire spread will be in your simulations. So that's very difficult, because you have this positive feedback loop, and if you make an error somewhere in all of these phenomena that, uh, that I have already mentioned, your error keeps growing over time, and your simulations become uh, practically uh, useless. So much for the introduction on the physics. I don't see too many people sleeping yet, so that's good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for bearing with me. So I want to spend just a few minutes on this initiative uh, of, uh, of MACFP. MACFP is an acronym. Uh, it stands for Measurements and Computations of Fire Phenomena. And it's an initiative that was taken a few years ago under the umbrella of uh, IFSS, the uh, International Associations of, uh, of Fire Safety Science. And I will not read through this sentence. I will give you uh, some time to, uh, to read through it. But uh, an important word here is that it's a structured effort. Uh, it's focused on research. Yeah? So we try to understand the uh, fundamentals uh, that you see here at the bottom of phenomena related to fire. We want to have some more in-depth understanding of physics and also chemistry uh, taking place. And so uh, another important statement that you can find on the, on the website um, that is mentioned over there is that this is a joint effort of people doing experiments and people doing numerical simulations. So we bring together uh, uh, modelers, yeah, so people like myself, uh, where the, the focus is on trying to develop better models for what's happening in reality, and people doing the real stuff, people doing the experiments. And we exchange a lot uh, of wish lists, let's say, from the modelers, and then limitations uh, indicated by experimentalists, but they then try to understand better what we need, and we can try to express uh, uh, what uh, actually are important aspects uh, to get to reliable uh, simulations. And I'm uh, mentioning um, here briefly that we have uh, proceedings of the first workshop that, that took place last year uh, in, uh, in Lund. So if you want to uh, find out more of the details, uh, uh, feel free uh, to, um, uh, to read uh, through, this, uh, through this paper. Um, but the global principle of this uh, effort is that we uh, identified a couple of uh, test cases, some target uh, test cases to focus uh, on uh, certain phenomena. And one of them uh, is indeed in this uh, turbulent wall fire uh, setup, uh, where experiments have been done uh, a few decades ago by now by uh, John Deris uh, at, uh, at FM Global in the, um, in the US. And it's not my intention to talk you through uh, 
uh, all of the uh, uh, complex physics and, and, uh, and aspects in modeling, but I just want to show you one result. Uh, so what you see here at the, uh, the left-hand side are some CFD results, uh, not, not our own uh, CFD results that were uh, done by uh, uh, Dr. Yi Wang uh, at FM Global together with uh, Professor Trouvé uh, at, uh, at Maryland. And you see here like a cross section of flames. This is the wall uh, where you have this uh, vertical fire. You have the temperature scale. So the highest temperature that you see here on the scale is 1800 uh, Kelvin, so 1500 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, and you can recognize some of these turbulent structures, uh, some of these, uh, let's say it's not smooth, the surface, uh, so you have some, uh, some disturbances. And here at the right hand side, what you see here are, are mean flame temperatures. So you uh, look at pictures like this, you put them one on top of the other, you take the average, and then you get a smooth um, uh, profile again with obviously lower uh, temperatures. So let's say the maximum mean temperature is around 1000 uh, degrees uh, centigrade. Now, if you want to get to a reliable result here without too many modeling assumptions, what you actually need to do is have enough detail in your simulations to capture these complex structures. If you want to go really detailed on the flow field, on the mixing, on the convective heat transfer, you need to what is called resolve all these details. Resolving means that you need to put a very fine computational mesh. Computational mesh is the points where you solve the equations. I need to take one step back. If you look at reality, then something is happening everywhere at any moment in time. But you cannot do that on your computer. You don't have an infinite memory on your computer and you cannot wait infinitely long. So what you do is you calculate on a limited number of points, you calculate there the velocities, the temperatures, the pressure. Limited number of points, that's typically a few millions these days with computing powers as you have it now. And you don't calculate at any moment in time. No, you take time steps and you do some interpolation of results between these time steps. Time steps could be in the order of a tenth of a second or maybe less, maybe a millisecond or for some cases, maybe a minute. And so that depends from, from case to case. So this was a small side explanation. What you see here is like a visual or a visible um, uh, representation of such a computational mesh. And so you see here some kind of zoom in of phenomena taking place here very close to the wall. So you have to imagine something like this and you transport this uh, to this picture. So you have here in this case, it's a velocity profile and it goes through a maximum at some point and then goes to zero again far away from the, from the wall. So this point at the wall is here y equals zero. The maximum velocity that you see over here is probably going to be somewhere over here and then it goes to zero uh, outside the flame. If you want to resolve all of these details, you need a mesh uh, such uh, that you have here only a few millimeters of, of spacing. Millimeters. Suppose you want to calculate a fire in this room and you need to have a mesh with a point every single millimeter, you will need billions and billions of cells to, to fill this room with a computational mesh. Impossible to do impossible to do now, impossible to do in the foreseeable future. So what we are trying to do here is try and come up with some error quantification if you don't want to spend so much time uh, on these details. And so how far off are you if you don't resolve uh, these uh, types of uh, flows? And so this is practically impossible and, uh, and so we'll see uh, what happens. Now this was just an example uh, in terms of the flow field and thereby convection, uh, convective heat transfer. But the similar story can be told about radiation. Yeah? So also there, uh, a lot of uh, research is going on. Okay, let's talk a bit about geometry now. Yeah? So we've gone through the physics, we've gone through the heat transfer, and I'll just uh, walk you through a couple of uh, configurations just to illustrate from a research point of view uh, that there are challenges uh, in, in these things. So the single flat vertical wall I've discussed, uh, so I'm not going to, to say uh, too much more uh, about that. You have entrainment from one side uh, and you have this heat transfer uh, problem. Uh, but a, a couple of years ago, uh, one of my PhD students, former PhD student, Shivan Antoisan, um, tried to develop some modeling for uh, this coupled pyrolysis combustion process. And one of the configurations that he looked at was two parallel panels. 
So two parallel vertical panels uh, at some distance from each other. The experiments were done at Lund University uh, with, uh, with Patrick van Hees. Uh, so what you see here is the setup. Oh, sorry, the wrong button. Um, so here in the middle, you have a, a burner. Uh, I'm forgetting the heat release rate now, but I think it was in the, in the order of 100 kilowatt. Uh, we have here two parallel panels of uh, two meters high, if I remember well, and about one meter uh, wide within some certain distance. And this arrow just indicates more or less where the flame front is on the solid material. So you can imagine that if these panels are at a certain distance from each other and you bring them closer to each other, what happens is two things mainly. First of all, if these plates come together close, more closely, the view factor for radiation increases. The closer you are, the more radiation you will feel. So these panels start to radiate heat to each other, speeding up the heat transfer process. That's one thing. The second thing that happens is that if these panels get closer to, to each other, the flames are kind of made longer because entrainment from the sides is limited a bit and the flow field changes, so the flame spread is increasing. So you would expect uh, from this point of view that if you put the panels closer and closer to each other, it would go more and more rapidly. Well, that's what we saw until a situation where the plates were so close together that part of the combustion no longer takes place in between the panels. The flames don't find oxygen anymore in between the panels and they start to burn outside. So you start to see a decrease again in the speed of flame spread. We had not thought about that before, but once seeing this, it's actually quite logical to explain this. A second thing that happens is that if you bring these panels closer to each other, turbulence cannot develop so much. Yeah? So turbulence, you can think of this as like a wild river or a waterfall, and so you have these large vortical motions inside the water. Well, if you bring the panels close to each other, these vortices cannot grow as strongly as when the panels are a bit further away from each other. Why am I saying this? Because if you think about this as, as a test for, um, uh, for fire spread, uh, you need to think about these things because in reality, if you have a large facade, there's no such thing as combustion uh, outside the two panels. Yeah? So you are here, ha you see here some energy that is released that does not contribute to the flame spread as much as if it had been enclosed in between these panels. Uh, so this is just a caveat uh, when, you, uh, when you want to extrapolate findings that you see on this scale and you want to go to full scale uh, testing, uh, this might be something uh, to, uh, to actually really uh, seriously uh, consider. Uh, so that is just an illustration that the configuration uh, does uh, matter. Um, second configuration that I want to discuss in a bit more detail is uh, research that is still ongoing in my team by uh, Dave, Dave Zenali, uh, who is, uh, if all goes well, is now writing his PhD as I speak. Uh, and, uh, and what he did is he studied uh, fire spread in corner uh, configuration. Uh, so you can think of this as the SBI setup, the single burning item test uh, setup. I'll, I'll show you in a, in a second. And from a, a fundamental point of view, there's a few things that are interesting. So one thing is that it has been observed that fire spread can be much faster in corner configurations than uh, on a single wall. Uh, but also uh, understanding this uh, from a more fundamental point of view and even more so predicting this with numerical simulations is, is quite a challenge. And so he did a series of tests, I'll give you the overview later on, uh, where he tested two types of wood. I forgot to mention uh, we uh, haven't studied and also are not yet planning to study composite materials. And so everything I'm saying uh, are uh, processes taking place at the surface primarily, so not something taking place at the interior uh, of a material. So I'm just uh, here sticking to two types of wood, uh, so plywood and, uh, and MDF. And he also did some tests where one or both panels were non-combustible, so calcium silicate uh, panels. I'll explain uh, why, why we did that. This is a sketch of the geometry in case you're not familiar with the setup. So here we have the uh, corner where the two panels are positioned. So here the size is half a meter wide, one and a half meter high, one meter wide, one and a half meter high. We have here a triangular burner in the corner where we have a 30 kilowatt 
uh, source of, uh, of heat independent of the materials that are tested over here. We have an extraction hood. It's not uh, on the sketch here, but here we have a certain flow rate that is um, uh, extracted. Everything else is, uh, is closed except here for the bottom part. You only see a very small part of it, but this is like a rectangular opening beneath this floor. Uh, so this extraction uh, also causes some uh, uh, entrance of air from below, and then it turns and reaches uh, the combustible uh, uh, panels. You have here an overview of uh, the series of 21 tests that uh, Dave uh, performed. Just to talk you a bit through the letter code, uh, although I will repeat this. Uh, so when you see CS, it uh, refers to calcium silicate, so non-combustible material. Uh, if you see CSCS, it means that both panels were calcium silicate. Uh, if you see, for example, here MM, it means that both panels are MDF wood, so both panels are combustible. And when you see combinations, so for example here MCS, that means that one of the panels, I think the short panel is, uh, no, the long panel is mentioned first. So MCS means that this one is MDF and this one is calcium silicate. And we tried also the, uh, the mirroring uh, setup, so where we have this one as calcium silicate and this one as MDF. So we deliberately went through a series of tests to try and uh, quantify uh, what is the impact of the configuration uh, on uh, the uh, burning uh, process. Okay, so this is what one of the tests uh, look like and also how we tried to analyze this. So here again, we have now a zoom in of this triangular burner 30 kilowatts. Here you see that this is material that has already participated and we had some, or we created some video footage uh, and with some automatic analysis to try and identify where is the front of pyrolysis. So in other words, where do you have the uh, boundary between virgin material and material that uh, has already participated now, and where do we see flame? And sometimes that's a bit difficult to uh, identify because you could argue that this is the real flame zone, but if you do an automatic analysis, you will also identify flames over here. Yeah, so this, these are details that we took into account. And we ended up with pictures like this. This is probably too complex to digest uh, immediately, but what you see here are two-dimensional plots. So this is the x-axis, which is the, I should maybe go back, uh, so the x-axis is like this, yeah, so the horizontal direction, so we have here the long panel, uh, short panel, and the y-axis is here the uh, vertical uh, axis. And we have here instantaneous uh, visualization of where the flames are over time. So at the beginning, time equal 50 seconds, the flames are still quite localized inside the corner, and as time proceeds, the flames primarily go up, and then they have also some lateral spreading uh, over the panels. Don't worry about the details, and uh, that's not uh, too, um, uh, too relevant for the time being. Uh, but that's only one result. Yes? So we also measured the total heat release rate. So how much heat is released per unit time. So here on the horizontal axis you have time, on the vertical axis you have the total heat release rate. The dots are the experimental data. The curves are with two different numerical settings. So one was where we assumed a uniform density uh, inside the wood. And what we see then is we have pretty good match at the beginning. We miss the peak. And then we have a pretty good match in the later stages. Whereas if you use some non-uniform mass density inside the wood, uh, you have a better representation of the initial peak, but then an undershoot uh, later on. We haven't fully, well, we figured out what is the, the reasons for that, and, but we have not fully uh, illustrated that you can actually uh, remedy that. Because overall in all, the results are not that crazy. So what you see here, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, is that the flame spread from the simulations, which are the lines, match quite well with what we see experimentally, which are the symbols. Yeah, so it's not a perfect match, but remember the positive feedback loop. It's very difficult to have this in place, yeah, so we are already very happy that we are uh, on the same uh, map. So just to illustrate with a, a short video uh, what that looks like, yeah, so at the right-hand side you see the evolution of the total heat release rate over time, and at the left-hand side you see a visual uh, image. So at the beginning we have here pretty rapidly the 30 kilowatts, which is the triangular burner uh, by itself, and then it takes a while, uh, this is in seconds, and so what you see here is real time, you know, more or less uh, one uh, minute of uh, experimental footage, so you see these flames start to grow, uh, 
clear, clearly some turbulence uh, inside uh, this flow, and, and then you go to this uh, peak uh, heat release rate in a pretty uh, re short uh, period in time. Talking about time, I got the signal that I need to speed up a little bit, uh, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll do that. So you can, you can then think, well, you told us that you have a very strong positive feedback loop, eh? so maybe uh, these test results that you have, they might not be very uh, well repeatable. Eh? So that's why we also uh, tried to do uh, the same test uh, three times in this case, so with both panels combustible. And you see it's, it's not perfectly repeatable, of course, but all in all, the overall behavior is, uh, is very repetitive. Uh, you need to bear in mind that actually, if you want to look at the contrast contribution of the material itself, you should subtract the uh, contribution of the burner. So this, what you see now, uh, on top of this uh, shaded uh, area, is the actual contribution of the panels, of the combustible panels, to the total heat release rate, uh, which you see uh, on the vertical axis. If you look more closely, you see, you see two peaks. Uh, so you have here a first peak, where a lot of surface uh, action is taking place, then this wood will create some char on, uh, on, the, on the surface, so you have your small dip after the first fast action, and then you go to the real peak uh, when uh, this char starts falling off, uh, and then uh, you have this uh, further uh, evolution. Now, one of the interesting questions, at least according to ourselves, is, uh, is this okay if we now have results for this configuration and we have results for this configuration and if we add those two results, uh, how close are they uh, to the configuration where you have both panels uh, combustible? So this is what you see now. So this graph, uh, I'll, I'll talk you through it, is as a function of time, you have here the heat release rate of the sum of what you have with the long panel combustible, short one non-combustible, and the opposite. Now you need to make sure, we only look here at the panel heat release rate, so that means that we are subtracting now twice the heat release rate of the burner, because it was twice in the test. It was one uh, for the long panel combustible and once for the short panel uh, combustible. Now this is what you get if you have both panels combustible. So you see a more rapid increase when both panels are combustible and a clearly higher peak. You see, I don't know if you see that from the back, but the uh, mo uh, bars that you see here is some kind of uncertainty, repeatability issues, but it's, uh, it's really quite distinguished that you have a higher heat release rate if both panels are combustible. We knew that before, but this is also some quantitative uh, information uh, which is now uh, useful uh, for um, uh, numerical simulations for some testing and validation of uh, of codes. So some of the explanations that we can give is that, again, if you have this corner configuration that these panels are exchanging heat amongst themselves, so they are radiating to each other, but also if you have now fuel being released from both panels at once, the mixing with air is limited because the corner only gives you like a 90 degree angle of entrainment of air. So that means if you have more release of combustible gases, the flames will occupy a larger volume and you will have uh, some uh, faster um, uh, spread. So again, uh, the configuration matters and obviously also uh, combustibility of material uh, will uh, matter in this uh, flame spread. Very briefly on, uh, on curtain walls, uh, so what you have now uh, is that if you have two walls with an air gap in between, then the flow is restricted in between uh, this gap. So you can wonder how well turbulence can develop. It's very difficult to measure. It's very difficult to model. So this is a question mark. What about the heat transfer, which is related to this turbulence? And what about combustion, uh, which is also related to the mixing of uh, the fuel uh, with the gases? You can have cavity barriers, making things even more complex from a fluid mechanics point of view. And so I think there's a lot of uh, open questions at the moment and a lot of work uh, for, uh, for all of us uh, to do. So I'm not going to go deeper on that. Uh, also very quickly, uh, for the sake of time, uh, some of the results where uh, a master thesis was done in the uh, IMFSE program, the International Master of Fire Safety Engineering. Uh, this thesis was done at University of Maryland where they did some salt water experiments, salt water and to try and mimic the effect of buoyancy of the force of, uh, of Archimedes. 
And so what they did is uh, look at different configurations of louvers and try to see how quickly you would have some uh, spread of, in this case, smoke uh, into uh, the adjacent um, or, or in the room or in the floor, uh, I should say, uh, above. So you have to... Uh, take a, a little bit of a brain exercise here. So salt water, the salt is more heavy uh, than, um, than the water. So here in this experiment, the flow would be from the top to the bottom if you have a fire and the flow would be from the uh, uh, bottom to the, uh, to the top. And so there was a series of tests, but also a series of numerical simulations, in this case with, um, with FDS. And uh, uh, you see here different positioning of louvers. Now, if you look at these, you will probably easily understand that if the fire is over here, uh, that if you have louvers like this, this will actually stimulate flow uh, into uh, the floor above. And if you have louvers like this, it will actually deviate the smoke uh, outward, so you'll have less flow uh, going uh, to, the, um, to the inner floor. But it becomes more tricky when you look at this one. Actually, maybe I should ask, uh, who thinks that uh, you will have more smoke going in on, on this floor in this configuration than in this one, with hand raising? Who thinks you will have more with this configuration? Raise your hand. Okay. Who thinks you will have more in this configuration? Okay, that's more, more people, okay. And then um, if you, uh, let's, let's, let's just check the results. And so here, uh, what you see, M1 is this configuration, indeed, gives rise to the highest flow rate. Uh, that's on the, on the vertical axis, on the highest flow rate on to the top abo above. Uh, so most of you had this one right. But the, ones, uh, the one here with the fully closed configuration actually leads to the lowest inflow. On the, on the floor above. That was something quite unexpected. And that's because uh, if, you, if you close it completely, you know, that actually most of the flow is forced to, to flow up and there is less tendency to flow in. It's a matter of pressure differences. Yeah? So this was quite, uh, quite unexpected. And it was also uh, uh, confirmed in the CFD calculations. Now, Chair, before you get too optimistic, uh, I have a few slides in my concluding comments. So it's going to take another five minutes to, uh, to end this talk. Uh, so, so, so first of all, first of all, what I said so far is that you have many, many phenomena. Uh, and uh, all of them are difficult to model and they have a, a lot of interaction. Uh, so that's, that's one difficult part when it comes to modeling these things, but also probably when it comes to testing these things. Then there's many geometries that are possible. Uh, so also there, there is um, there's a big uh, impact or pot potential impact from the uh, the configuration. Uh, and when you want to scale up to large scale fires, uh, you need to carefully think uh, uh, as to whether all these phenomena uh, scale up in the same way or not. And if not, then what is the impact of that? Now the few minutes I, I want to take is very brief, also on the effect of wind, yeah? because so far what I talked about were experiments at lab scale. Yeah? So very well controlled, no uh, strong uh, wind conditions, uh, but we also had a PhD that was finished last year uh, by Go Shang Zhao, who's now at Imperial College, uh, where he looked at some fire in a small room with uh, ejecting flames, and then he did some blind simulations, so meaning we didn't have any experimental data uh, to look at the effect of wind. So this is a sketch that you see in the absence of wind, so uh, not everything can burn inside. You have ejecting flames, and you can have uh, flames spread over this vertical surface. And then he looked at the possible impact of, uh, of wind. And the results are quite striking, and by now have also been confirmed by experimental data uh, at US STC in China. Um, so what you see here from the left to the right uh, are exactly the same configurations inside the room, exactly the same material on the vertical surface, but now wind is coming from the right hand side to the left. So you have to imagine uh, wind uh, perpendicular to the uh, opening uh, of, the, of the room, so you're blowing here from the right to the left, and what you see here is the evolution for different wind velocities. And it's quite striking that what happens, what, what happens at least in the CFD, yes, and, and so if the CFD is accurate, it should also happen in reality, what happens is that you're actually kind of pushing back the flames closer to the opening for two reasons. First of all, the air has its own velocity, so it will actually have some counter pressure against the flows that want to escape. But second, you're also feeding the fire there with a lot of new oxygen. 
So the combustible gases find oxygen much closer to the opening. Now, I'm not claiming that this would be a good strategy to try and fight this fire because this is just a single room and you may not want to push uh, gases into the building, but at least it shows that wind uh, has a, a very strong impact not only on the spread but also on what's happening uh, at the level of the opening. This is then some uh, uh, the view from the other side, but now also with wind from the other side. So that's a side wind. And so then what you see here, as you would expect, is that you have some tilting uh, of the, the flame zone. And this comes automatically uh, out of the uh, CFD uh, calculations. So now I am uh, reaching the end. Uh, so there's a lot of research that's going on. Uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics, has a lot of potential, uh, but obviously uh, this uh, need also requires more validation. So we, there's a strong need uh, for uh, experimental data for, uh, uh, and for testing uh, of, uh, of the different types of materials and, and configurations. I'd just like to say a few words of thanks because what I presented today is not something that I did personally. This is work uh, of years by uh, master students and, and PhD students and postdocs uh, of my team. Uh, and this could not be done uh, without funding, uh, so particularly also th thanks to all the, uh, the sponsors also for, of our program, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you. But if you uh, please can stay on the stage uh, for one couple of minutes. Uh, I'm very much impressed by your presentation because, I, as I told you in the beginning, I don't have a technical background, but I really understood what you were telling. And it was for me very interesting. And I can, I can imagine that people who are more into this are feeling that they are like what we say in Dutch, feeling that they are in a candy store. Because you give us a lot of information, and I had a slip of the tongue with 45 hours, but <laughs> if we let you go on for yeah. 45 hours, I think you will manage. Uh, uh, well, I never yeah. tried. <laughs> so are there any really, are there questions? Are there people who have a question? Okay, I'm gonna... Oh! Oops. <laughs> 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 sorry. Well, they said I could do it, so I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question of uh, the slide with the wind perpendicular uh, yep. on the, the, the room. Yeah. Is that a room uh, that has another opening in no. it? No. It's so fully closed. Fully closed. So all you have here is a fire source. Okay. Uh, walls and, uh, and only one opening here at the side. And from here on, it was also wood in this experimental setup. So nothing open. So the only escape route for the gases was through this opening. Yeah. Remarkable. Yep. Thank you. Other questions? You can throw the dice somewhere in the audience and then so. somebody else can ask a question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are oh, we going to be interactive anyway now? Well, I have, I have some good backup people here. Ruth and Liwe and Ricardo, they promised me that if there are no questions, you would, be, you would ask questions because you are very interested in this, what's happening here, I know. Probably you should throw so the microphone back microphone to the front back to so the that front. the question is recorded. Yeah. Whoa, the quarterback yeah. is here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Bart, Ruth van Herpen, uh, University of Eindhoven. Um, this, this slide, these calculations for the external flames, yeah. what, what mesh width did you, did you use there? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I don't know from the top of my head, but what we did, uh, so one of the important aspects in these simulations is to have an accurate representation of what happens here at the opening. So <clears throat> uh, this is getting a bit technical, but I'll, I'll give the, the answer. So the, the classical criterion that is used for the resolution of the computational mesh is based on resolving what happens on top of the fire. That's for people who used FDS as the D star criterion, and that stems to what's happening here at the burner. Now, if you have a flow through an opening, then it's important to have approximately 10 cells across the, uh, in this case, width of the opening. Let's say, in general, the smallest side of the opening. So from the top of my head, this uh, opening was a scale model. I think it was about one meter high. So this must have been approximately a 10 centimeter mesh. So what we did not try to do is resolve here very accurately what happens at the wall. So for sure, 
uh, improvements could be done there. Uh, but it's really quite important to resolve what's happening here at the opening. So it must have been around a 10 centimeter mesh uh, on, on, on that. Yeah, I guess that the mesh is more more fine than it's uh, inside. When, when for, for the inside fire, you could use, for instance, overhaul generator, something like that. For, yeah. For, yeah. yeah so but I think that, that doesn't, you, you cannot apply <laughs> The same technique for the for the external flame. Uh, if you if you want to go to full scale, that's that's also one of the problems of scaling up CFD. Thanks for asking this question, by the way, Ruth. Uh, so that's a problem of scaling up CFD simulations as well, um, because if the geometry scales, your volume of your computational domain scales, yeah. and so if you need to stick to the same uh, cell size as you know very well, uh, you also need to go to higher numbers of grid cells. If you don't want to do that, you would no start to give up accuracy of, uh, of phenomena that are taking place close to the wall. And for example, if you would go to a 50 centimeter mesh, this would for sure not be good enough anymore to have resolution there. And so there, we are being helped by the software and hardware developers. Eh? So computers are getting more powerful. We have HPC facilities, uh, high performance uh, computer facilities. So that all helps, but also for sure, like doing CFD calculations of an entire high-rise building with a 10, 5 centimeter mesh is not for the foreseeable future. And so there is a, a challenge. Uh, and that's why in this MacFP effort, we also try to quantify how quickly does it become unacceptable in terms of, uh, of accuracy. Yeah, thanks. So maybe next year. Uh, maybe next year, but that's a bit optimistic. <laughs> oh, another <laughs> we're, not, we're not that awesome. fast. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Bart, for this presentation. I'm yeah. still trying to process uh, all the things you said. Okay. Uh, one thing that sticks in my mind is uh, the test you showed where you're putting the panels nearer to each other. Yep. So uh, if I uh, have it right, um, that if you move them to each other, the flame gets longer, yes. but when the... Uh, cavity gets uh, within a distance, yeah. you get this flaming at the sides. Yeah. Does that mean that in uh, small cavities you should also uh, look into horizontal uh, flame spread? Or, or isn't that, can um, you not conclude this? We, we cannot tell from these tests for the simple reason that the burner that you see over here uh, occupied the entire width of the panel. So there was no horizontal flame spread here. It was only vertical flame spread. Yeah. And so what you what you have here flowing outside is then just not participating, not contributing to this vertical flame spread. In our experience, horizontal flame spread so far has been relatively very slow compared to the vertical one. Uh, so even in this corner configuration, if you uh, if you go to this uh, yeah. This plot again, you see that the, so the first phenomena here, there's not much happening in a horizontal direction. It's only once the flames reach the vertical one, vertical limit, let's say, of the panel and didn't find any more material that it also started to consume what happened, uh, what happened here at the sides. So my guess, but it's a guess, we cannot test, is that if the panels had been higher, this horizontal flame threat would have still been yeah. postponed a bit because it was easier to find the material uh, up there to, to participate. Okay. Yeah. There's a question in the back now. I don't know if we still have time, but now someone is waving. So, um, and uh, it must be a very important question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in your own lunch time. So. <laughs> oh. um, Roy Weghorst from Kingspan. Um, Bart, in that, that parallel panel test you showed, um, have you done experiments with the sides closed so that you don't have any oxygen entrainment from the sides? No, we haven't. Um, that's a short answer. Uh, the, but to give a bit more, the, the, the bit more explanation, if, if we were to close the sides, we would fundamentally also change the feeding of oxygen into the, into the fire source. Uh, I, we didn't test, but my guess is that quite rapidly the, the fire would starve from oxygen if you, if you had the sides closed and not too much would happen other than some smoldering combustion uh, close to the, to the burner itself and the fire would probably die. But that would also not be a, a very good representation of reality, of course, because if you have like, let's say, a, a wider facade, you would have uh, uh, oxygen from the surroundings that, that might actually reach the fire. Uh, so, the, so no, we didn't test, uh, but would also be clear issues issues if we had uh, closed the, uh, the sites. We would have some kind of a chimney fire. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bart. Um, can you please give a, a very warm applause for Bart again? <laughs> <laughs>